my name is Chelsea Jackson and I am a learning specialist with Rocky View School Division and I am at Division Office so I cover the whole area. So we have Airdrie, Chestermere, out to Cochrane, Red Creek, just so you have an idea of, of what we're, the size of us. We have over 20,000 students so we're small but mighty. So I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 7 territory in Métis Region 3. I would also like to acknowledge all of our elders for the wisdom and guidance today and I want to thank you for taking the time to spend your day with us so we can learn from one another. I would also like to acknowledge all of the educators in the room and that's every single one of us that walks into a school. We are all educators. So I'm thankful to be here to learn with you and from you and so together let's move forward. So uh, the agenda for today my overarching theme is really going to be relationship building and I really focused on the professional learning we're doing with our educators. So what's changed in this three years? What are we doing differently in this three years? So I also want to say this is a highlight reel. So it's not all glossy fun skipping through the fields. There's a lot of hard work to do to still eliminate those disparities and inequalities that we see in our schools. So this work is not easy. It's not always well received by staff and community and family, but we need to keep going. So I work with a very, very supportive crew who holds the same passion and openness, and I would like to introduce you to some of them. So um, they're all back here, and I'm going to make them stand up and say hello. So um, I will start with the Rocky D Schools um, Director of Learning Supports, um, Greg Roberts. And I have our, well, I see she's missing, our First Nations Métis and Inuit um, connector, Jackie Simons. She's sneaking in. <laughs> So they both work tirelessly for our students and our staff, and I'm really lucky to be part of such a strong team. Now, of course, we have a, a whole learning supports department as well, but um, they really help um, lead this work forward. So we've brought some very special and important people with us today, and I want to acknowledge all of them. So Sykes Powderface from Stony Nakoda, if you can just give a wave. We're tucked in the back corner there. Virgil Stevens from Stony Nakoda. <laughs> Randy Bottle from the Blood Tribe, Sheldon First Rider, an educator with Glenbow Museum, and we are also missing uh, Buddy Wesley today, but I did want to say thank you, Buddy, and I'm, unfortunately he couldn't be here with us today. And then, of course, Daniel Boroff, and she is the manager of education at Glenbow Museum. Thanks, guys. Okay, so according to our agenda, I'm going to just highlight um, kind of two major um, uh, professional learning projects that we've done this in the last three years. And I'm going to briefly touch on the poverty simulation kit and the brain game. Um, and then we always offer responsive professional learning opportunities, so I just briefly touched that, but we're going to focus kind of on the two. So I'm only in my second year of this role, so I had to hit the ground running. and. Okay, go and do it, and this is now part of your portfolio, and one part of my portfolio. So I really needed to start with relationship building. So I had to start building my own capacity and then finding ways to deliver, coordinate, authentic, meaningful opportunities to introduce First Nations, Métis, Inuit ways of knowing into our schools. And you can tell, I walk in right away, not authentic, right? So I need to make relationships to make this work. So I wanted to ask Sykes Powderface to come up. He has been whirled through many of these types of meetings and conferences and projects through the years. And I just want to give him about five minutes to talk about relationships and collaboration. And is this time any different? <laughs> and what can we do as educators to make it different? Like what do we need to know to effectively connect to community and elders? So Sykes, if you can speak to that, thank you. One of the first things that we all talk about, and that the uh, because I've been involved with education for quite a number of years now, is that uh, the uh, different words have been used: collaboration, engagement, connection, and everything else. To to me, it all means relationship building. It's relationship that we're looking for. What kind of a relationship are we looking for? If we're going to be connected, we better have a relationship. 
because I have a relationship with my wife, and I, and I had to connect with her. The first one, that's the first thing. And they call it engagement. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, one of the uh, one of the first things that everybody's talking about in different fields, I've been involved in in all kinds of uh, areas, uh, being the jack of all trades. And in the last five days, this is my fourth meeting, and I still got two more to go to tomorrow and the next day. And uh, the, it seems like the, everywhere you you have uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people together, they all talk about engagement relationship building how do we connect we need to know those things so i've been talking about uh, I'm beginning to sound like a broken record because i keep talking about the same thing the first thing that you want to go you want to get into the community you want to get to know the community you want to get to know the people you must understand, you just don't barge in there and uh, start raising questions about who they are and, and everything else. You got to show respect. Respect to know that we do have protocols. We have very, very strict protocols. And to make connections, the first people that you need to know is elders elders because elders do not elders just like me i'm beginning to experience that i need a little more space than i used to elders don't like to be crowded and be bombarded with questions and everything else let them talk that's the first thing is you got to show respect and that's the protocol and one of the things that the uh, we've been talking about and i've been talking about is we also have, I've heard from different institutions that I've talked to and uh, about this relationship with the elders. The question keep coming up, who is an elder? What is an elder? And just like in the dominant society's professional world, we have elders at different levels of professionalism. We have elders which we categorize in two different types of elders. One are the traditional elders. We have traditional elders whose focus is to help people understand who they are and the life that we live. Be responsible and accountable. Those are the type of elders that we call elders. If you're looking for wisdom, if you're working for cultural skills, wisdom, cultural knowledge, those are the ones that you need to get to know. But we also have another set of elders. We call them knowledge elders. Elders that have, that have known the best of the two worlds, that have taken the best of the two worlds, and that's the academic and cultural world, and put it together and made it work. And these are some of the people that are out there. These are the elders where you would need some help the students to, uh, to make that transition, the Aboriginal street students to make that transition into the white world. Those are the elders that you need to talk to so they can share their experiences and how they made it across that have well adapted to the non-Aboriginal world as well. So those are the ones because they come to you with different skills because of their academic levels and experiences and their wisdom. They come with a different one. Those are things that you need to know when you're making connections with the elders. Because we also have, which I didn't want to talk about, but we also have Want to be elders? I'm I here, I'm I, and I'm hearing this from the corporations that I work with. There's four, 40 to 55 year old who are saying I'm an elder simply because they now have read something about being an Indian that did, never grew up 
on the res or never grew up under the tutorship of elders. Uh, but those are, they call themselves elders and then they hand out, okay, I want 500 bucks to come and do a sweat for you. Saturday, I was at a meeting and, uh, the, uh, and I'm happy to say that an elder from Siksika also noticed this is what was happening. He said, these type of people give us a black eye and that was just exactly the way he said. He said there people are now having a totally different different perception of what our culture is and what our spirituality are, are because we see them doing the practice and putting us through the through the sweats and everything else and talk to us about that. But when we see them in everyday life, it's totally different because an elder sets the world by example, becomes a role model, practice what they preach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sykes. I hate to move on after that. Okay, if we switch gears a little bit, and um, I wanted to talk about our collaborative inquiry projects that we've done with Stony Nakota Schools. We did highlight this last year, um, but I just want to really point out that this isn't just a we go to them once, they come to us, and we had some cultural teachings in it. It is very... Um, intentional, deliberate planning. It's guided by a learning specialist. Um, we provided a learning specialist last year to work with Sony Nakota teachers and our own teachers to walk them through an inquiry by design process and then build something together. So I don't have time to show you the video and we did show videos last year so I won't show you the video but it is linked here. So again, it's very purposeful professional learning. Um, so our students are getting cultural components in that. Our teachers are working collaboratively with Stony Nakota, or so our Nakota Elementary. So um, again, they, they walk through a planning process. They have to implement those strategies. They have to learn to work together. Um, they then build, they have a one day where they build a video workshop on the work that they've done and compiled together. So they work as a team, Nakota Elementary teacher and, and their team teacher with one of our schools and they work together and then we walk them through building a video and creating a learning story. Um, they also um, created blogs. So there's that professional learning that we're getting for those on-reserve teachers that we know are severely underfunded. So we've been doing this for three years already, um, but we want to continue that work. So I did um, capture some of the teacher voices. Um, I don't know if I'm going to have time to share them with you today. Um, but um, it was just the feedback from the teachers on the process and how they found it. Um, and of course, I, it, was all, it was all good. <laughs> uh, actually, I shouldn't say that because I did send out a survey and, you know, sometimes we have this expectation that they're going to put on this big cultural show and that's going to be part of the learning. Well, that is a lot on, of stress on, um, on a First Nation school authority. So we really tried to come away from that. Like, no, we don't expect you to do a powwow. It's just about the connections and the learnings for the teachers and, of course, the students. So I won't share the teacher voices with you, but... Um, the other thing that we implemented this year was um, we've had communities of practice within our division for several years now. I think we're going into about our seventh. Um, but this year, I don't know if it was previous if we ever had a topic of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit as a community of practice. But this year, I'm a year and a half into my position, so I, uh, Greg says, hey, get one going. you got to get one going, so, so, um, so let's um, create a community of practice. I want to... Oh, I think... I think so really, this was just a link to um, our superintendent kind of explaining communities of practice, but I can do that quickly. Um, so at all staff, whether you're office staff, uh, divisional staff, have to sign up for a community of practice each year, and you can choose from probably hundreds that we have. Um, so whatever you're interested in learning, there's literacy ones, there's all sorts if you want to learn some technology stuff. Um, so we've included First Nations Métis Inuit as a choice. Um, this past year, it, you, you, um, we've set aside three professional learning days. So um, you sign up kind of the end of the end of the year or the beginning of the next school year to whatever you're interested in. And I thought, geez, I don't even know if I'm going to get enough people to even run this. So we went with it. I think I had 12 signed up the very first day. And then people kind of started trickling in. And so we had about 20 people in our community of practice. 
And the guiding question for the community of practice was, how can First Nations maintain Inuit teachings and perspectives be infused into everyday practice to benefit all students? So how can we change our practice? So all students are learning this. Um, so it's meant to educate, encourage, and guide division staff to champion this work. So this is kind of what um, it looks like. So I don't own the community of practice. I can just put in, hey, I'd like to run one. I could have done it on anything and hope people join, which is what happened. Um, so I set up the first day, and I just wanted us all to be on a level playing field. And um, we had Elder Randy Bottle um, participate with us, so he, he guided us through um, this process. So day one, we all started with Randy, and he gave us a workshop on this is, this is what it looks like. Um, so all the teachers, it was interesting, we had some coming in that were like, nope, I'm not starting with a prayer, like, I, I just don't do that. And then by the end, they're asking, they're asking to do more and more stuff. So even, that's just in the one day. Um, so out of that one day, I said, okay, where, what, do we, what do you guys want to do next? Like, now, you know, what do you want to do? And one of the high school um, social studies teachers said, well, let's go to Glenville Museum. And I was like, Glenville Museum, I haven't been there since I was a kid, stuffy, boring. I would never have chosen it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, but I was very, very wrong. <laughs> So we so that whole started a whole process of connecting with um, the Glenbow Museum, and hence why Sheldon Firstrider and Danielle are here with us today. So um, we went, we first connected with Danielle. I brought Solange and Elizabeth Cressman from the Calgary Regional Consortia into the conversation. I said, "This can benefit everybody." Solange, the project, oh, this is, you know, this is a great idea. And so we all went and met with Danielle. She walked us through the gallery, the Blackfoot exhibit, which is absolutely amazing if you haven't been there. Um, and of course, we send our kids there all the time. But teachers, teachers want to learn too, and they want they want to learn authentically from the Blackfoot educators that are there um, at the museum. So we had Ad Adrian Wolfleg and Sheldon Firstrider take us through, and we were also, of course, accompanied by Randy because he's our um, part of our community of practice. So amazing day, and if you haven't been in that museum, you the sense, the feeling, the awe when you are in that building is is spectacular. So from there, they they said, "Let's drum, let's do some drumming. How do we do that?" And I'm like, "Good question. How do we do that, Randy? How do we do that?" <laughs> so that's where I really look to the elder to say, "I don't know the process here. Um, is this something we can even do? And how do we do it respectfully and follow the protocols?" Um, so Randy helped guide that process for us. Um, so the morning of our third day, we spent going over the resources with Solange and, and sharing with, um, I should also mention, it's not just teachers in our CFP. We have educational assistants, we had speech language, pathologist and an assistant. So it was, it's whoever signs up. So that morning where we introduced the Moodle and all the resources, we really had to do it in such a way that everybody took something from it. Um, and I think, and. I think uh, it went over well. And then, of course, we did a drumming session, actually, with Darcy Turning Robe, who was there this morning, and uh, his cousin, Leonard Cutter. And they were very open and shared immensely with our staff. So, <clears throat> so this will continue, and it will continue to evolve. And um, it's just led by the participants and, and what they want it to look like. So <clears throat> this was a, so the two pictures on the side are of the Glenbow Museum. And then um, this is one of our learning support teachers out at Langdon School, so far out east. Um, and I, it's a little video, so I'll uh, just sh share her. Are you ready? So our FNMI CFP has been very enriching for me. It is a group of people who are dedicated to not only understanding what has happened in the past with our First Nations people, but also trying to look at ways in which we can move forward, looking to the First Nations for their guidance and their wisdom, and coming together as educators to pass along what we've learned to make our environment safe for all children and also to share the incredible resources that have been we've been privy to uh, in the CFP. I highly recommend it and I will be joining our team next year. So I managed to um, get Leanne to speak and 
and she just spoke, spoke to the rich, uh, the richness of, of the CFP and having the involvement of community and elders. Um, I just included this too, in case that didn't work. This is from another, um, it was just a quick email to me after. Overwhelmed, unforgettable experience. So, and now she's gonna take it forward with her high school, right? So now she feels empowered to move forward at the high school. So just to quickly touch on um, the Poverty Simulation Kit. It's a kit that, um, well, simulates poverty. Um, and it's to be used with staff, so they get an understanding of the impacts of poverty. Um, we purchased this kit as a division, so um, we've got it, we get it from the United States, and then you come up, and then I was lucky enough to go to the formal facilitator training. Um, so I can take this forward now, <clears throat> excuse me, use it not only for our staff, <clears throat> if I didn't need that drink of water, um, and also community members on just what is it like um, to live in and experience poverty. So you kind of, I don't know if any of you have done one before, but it's pretty chaotic and uh, it gives you a different uh, perception. And now this, of course, is universal for, for all of our students. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, this is universal for, for many of our students. Um, so we are trying to get one done before the end of June. Um, and we just actually did the training in May, so we're or no, sorry, March, but we're moving that forward. Um, and somebody else mentioned the brain game. Um, so again, that's where you build the brain with a group. Um, and, it, and it really just talks about those early stresses and brain development. Um, this is excellent professional learning too. For all of our stuff, we actually have a school psychologist that, that does this. And she has reached hundreds and hundreds of uh, community members and of our staff. Um, and she, she, can tie it, she ties it into trauma which could be intergenerational trauma as well. So um, although I, this isn't really my baby, it is something else that we do that, again, universally um, can help um, build professional learning for our staff. Two minutes back, I think. Um, so again, like we do professional learning all of the time, and we do it kind of as requested, and requests are weird and wild and come in we hear all sorts of things, but of course we do all of these things, which I think uh, probably all of you do. Um, with the Inquiry Project last year, we did present to the Treaty 7 principles, and um, uh, we are in discussion and have been asked to present again at the Treaty 7 conference, the actual conference in the fall. Um, whether that'll happen or not, I'm, I'm not sure. But, you know, I can't do any of this professional learning without collaboration and, and partnerships. So I'm really just like the bridge. I'm the bridge. Um, so again, if I tie it all back in, relationship building. Um, this is just to highlight some of the, the work our guests do. We can call on our elders and, and because we've developed relationships with them, we can ask them <laughs> lots of strange questions or they might think are strange, but we can ask them or what do you think we should do here or oh, maybe you should come in. And so we have that relationship starting, we're really starting to build on that. Um, so they'll come in, they'll talk one-on-one -on -one with a student, they'll talk with staff. So this is just kind of um, some things that, that um, we, can, we can ask them to help guide, guide our practice in. So without our external partners, our elders, the service providers, community members, none of this work would be meaningful. And I just want to thank each and every one of them for coming as guests of Rocky View. And um, also the Rocky View staff, um, that are champions of work in our schools. And of course, we have leaders in our schools. This is the division kind of outlook on it. We have some great leaders in our schools too. So I'm very excited um, to have tomorrow dedicated to, to your voices, community members, elders, um, so we can learn with and from you. Um, and just thank you, thank you very much. I had two seats and I was reading off my first one, which was something else that I had read. But what we're doing in Cochrane on this relationship building is I talked a little bit about the elders, making sure that you get the right elders. So the structure that we have uh, recently worked on uh, with, my, uh, with my colleagues, Virgil Stevens and Buddy Wesley, is that we, we are, because I'm here, from what I'm hearing at other uh, presentations that I mentioned is that uh, the um, 
they all talk about a resident resident elder. But but they're saying that the wet resident elder only has one focus and probably one dimensional experience and skills they can contribute to what they're looking for. And, uh, and it's not working. And I notice it's not working. So what we've done at, at Morley with the Stone and Nakoda is there's three of us that sit together and we act as the referral. Our role is a referral group. If any of the Cochrane schools want a specific elder, not just an elder to come, but something for a specific project or a specific task. They called us and we sit down and we look at who is available in certain areas because we know our people really well in our own world. As I mentioned, this is how we know that they like the professional world, they have different skills and so on for different purposes and so on. And this is what we're doing. We make the referral and we, uh, we uh, send those people to the school through Jackie and, uh, the, um, and, uh, the, and that's how they are able to contribute to the learning of the students because that's our focus and that's our main concern is make sure that we send the right elder to help those children in what they're doing, whatever tasks that they're doing. And I mentioned, I forgot to mention that one, and I just wanted to make sure that we have this process in place that is working really well. We have a list of elders that we work with, and uh, the uh, and it's working really well because we, we now have some uh, counseling elders. We have the spiritual elders that are available too if uh, children also need one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling right in school where they may be sensitive to lateral violence and so on within the school there's still there's still that too and our children are very very sensitive and when that need comes up we say we try to send the right people to help them that's the structure we got in this relationship building with Gawker thank you thank you so much, thank you so much.